Today, we're on five things you ought to know about salvation. You would think that everybody wants to be saved. I mean, why not? It's free. God loves you. He sent His Son Jesus to die upon the cross for you. All you have to do is, is to receive Christ as your Savior, confess your sins, accept that Christ's death upon the cross, and make Him Lord of your life, and you're saved. Why wouldn't everybody on the earth want to be saved, and why wouldn't they want to be saved through Jesus Christ? It's definitely the easiest way to be saved. So someone's saying, well, there's got to be an easier way than that. There's not. There's not a better way. I don't understand why the entire world, but yet the entire world is still looking for other ways to be saved. Other world religions are trying to find some way for people to give their life uh, to whatever God or to whatever prophet. Even among Christianity here in America, even denominations are trying to say, well, you've got to do this to be saved. Or you've got you to gotta do this or do that. You've got to be baptized. You've got to join the church. If you don't belong to church, you're not saved. Um, that, that's, we'll get to that in a moment. But there's a whole lot more to it than that. I just don't understand why everybody doesn't want to be saved. The majority of the world is not saved. Many people knowingly reject. They hear the plan of salvation. They hear Jesus Christ died for them. They hear they're a sinner and they need to be saved. And when they say, would you like to pray and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? They openly say, no. I don't want to. I don't understand why anybody would say no, but people say no. Then there's people who just have those false beliefs I was talking about. Uh, they believe that you've got to be so good or you've got to be baptized or you've got to do this thing and they've got all these works or whatever. If you do these things, well, those are false teachings. They're false beliefs around the world. And then the number one reason people don't get saved is procrastination. People intend to get saved. I think many, many, many people are saying, I'm going to get saved. Years ago, I was witnessing to a young man. His father had come. He said, my son's in the hospital. Go with me and let's talk to my son about getting saved. And the father had just been saved recently. Uh, an alcoholic type home, just uh, abusive type home growing up in it. And the father and me went and we sat there and we talked to his son on the bed. And his son uh, heard me share the gospel, how to be saved. And the boy said this. He says, I want to be saved. I know I need to be saved. I need to turn from the way I'm living and give my heart to Jesus Christ. But I'm going to do what my father did. I'm going to wait till I'm 50-something years old and I'm going to live however I want to and do whatever I want to right now. I'm going to have fun in life. And when I get 50-something like dad did, then I'm going to ask Jesus Christ into my heart to save me then. He was procrastinating. Some people just say, I'll get saved the next revival. Some people say, I'll get saved the next service. And we just, the devil loves procrastination. Just, just put it off for a little bit longer. If, you, if the devil can get you to put it off long enough, you'll wake up one day and find yourself in hell because you waited too late. Many are not sure they even need salvation. Well, I'm a good person. I'm okay. There's nothing wrong with me. Yes, there is something wrong with you. Yes, you do need salvation. Everybody needs to be saved. What does salvation mean? It means man has a need to be delivered from an impending danger. And you know, the sad thing is most people think that impending danger is hell. Or I need to be saved from the evilness of sin in this world. You know, you need a savior to save you from yourself. You are the sinner. We are all sinners. I am a sinner. We are saved from ourselves by Jesus Christ. Man is a sinner. You've heard the phrase patient zero. That's some kind of virus that gets started. That's some type of disease that gets started in this, this world. And they trace it back to this beginning point. To where this one person had the virus. And he's called patient zero. And everybody else becomes sick. Because patient zero has this virus. Well, sin is the same way. But each one of us is our own patient zero. You don't sin because you're a sinner. You sin. You commit sin. You break the law of God because you want to. It's in you. You are the problem. I am the problem. 
When I sin, I'm just doing what is natural. If I'm a sinner, let me give you a worldly example of that. Oh, I don't know how many true fishermen we have here today, but do understand a real fisherman goes fishing quite often. I might go once or twice a year. I would not call myself a fisherman. I put bait on my hook and throw it out in the water and hope a fish gets on there. I don't know what I'm doing. I am not a fisherman. But a real fisherman reads, study, he, he buys the right kind of boat, the right kind of bait. He's got these uh, reels that cost $5,321. Uh, you know, he's put his life into fishing and catching fish. He is dedicated to fishing. And he catches fish. He's a real fisherman. Now, he didn't just get in the boat and say, I'm a fisherman uh, because cause I might go one time and catch 20 fish. I might think I'm a fisherman, but because I caught the fish really don't make me a fisherman. You dedicate your life to something. That's what a sinner is. You sin. You go out here and do what you do because you are a sinner. When you see a sin, you say, oh no, I need to ask God to forgive me of what I have done. No, you need to ask God to forgive you of being a sinner. Salvation is confessing to God, not that I killed somebody, I'm an adulterer, I lie a lot, all of these things that I've done. Confession is when I admit with God, hey God, it's my fault. I did these things because I am a sinner. I am ground zero to all the sin in my life. It started in my heart before I ever laid a hand on it, before I ever said it, before I ever acted it out, I had already committed the sin in my heart. Jesus even says, the man who looketh upon a woman and lusteth, he is committing adultery. It means he's planning to do it. It's in his heart to be an adulterer, even before he commits the adultery. And by the way, that verse is not just male-oriented, it applies to women as well. John chapter 3, verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. Wait a minute, hear what he said. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn. Well, why, do, why doesn't he condemn the world? Because the world is already condemned. Before Jesus ever came, man is a sinner. That he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, before the fact. You are a sinner. You are born a sinner. That dear, sweet, innocent child is born with a sin nature within it. Now, let's praise God for a moment. Those babies are innocent into the sight of God until they come to the point in their life that they are accountable for their sins, that they recognize they have sinned. Actually, let me put it this way. The person who rejects Jesus Christ as Savior is the one who is condemned before God. But he's already been sinning. God, just by his grace and mercy, protects a dear child that leaves this world and goes into the presence of God before that time in life that he understands and rejects Christ. We need to make sure that we know that everybody is born a sinner. Romans chapter 3, verse 10, as it is written, there is how many? None. There's none of us that are righteous. No, not one. The emphasis of no, not is to say, Absolutely, positively, there's not anybody who's righteous on our own. We are all sinners. We do not become sinners. We are sinners. We believe the world needs a cure for cancer. Amen? Do you believe the world needs a cure for AIDS? And right now, we need a cure for the coronavirus. Do understand, they are just working on a vaccine to keep you from getting it. There is not a cure for the coronavirus. You just have to go through it like the flu, and they give you medicines to help you overcome it. But it's a disease. If you have the disease, you're going to have fever. If you have the disease, you're going to be sick at your stomach. If you have the disease, all of these things are going to happen, even the possibility of death, because you have the disease. If you have the disease of sin... The symptoms is all the sin that you are committing. For man to be saved, someone must be able to save and willing to save. Now, folks, if I had the ability, I'd save everybody here. I'd go out into the world and I'd just start, you're saved, I forgive you, you're saved. I forg you're, but I can't. I don't have the ability to save. I cannot save anyone. I cannot even save myself. Jesus is the cure for sinful man. Jesus is able 
to save us. When we call upon the name of Jesus, we don't have to say, I hope he's able. He is able to save us. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that, my salvation, which I have committed unto him against that day, the, the day that we stand before judgment. Hebrews reminds us that we're all going to die. When we die, we will stand before God in that final judgment. Jesus says, if you receive me as Savior, I will keep you. Jesus is not only able to save you, he's willing to save you. Somebody might not want to save you. There might even be somebody say, well, if I go to heaven and they're there, I don't want to go. Oh, that's crazy talk. But you know, Jesus wants everybody to be there. And when he died upon the cross, he died for everybody. He even tells us, for God so loved the world, not part of the world, not some of the world, not a few folks, that everybody he's willing to save. You know, it's got to be the word willing because he makes nobody to be saved. It is your choice to receive Jesus Christ who is able and willing to save you. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all, how many all, should come to repentance. He wants everybody to be saved. I asked the beginning of the sermon, why doesn't everybody want to be saved? I don't know, but I know he wants to save everybody. Jesus is the only one who can save us. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the only one. He's the only one. You can't decide I'm going to get to heaven another way. There's not another way. Why do we even look for a new way to be saved? When we already have Jesus. But yet man is looking for another way. Man says, well, maybe I can do this, or maybe I can do this. What? We don't want to depend upon God. We don't want to trust in God. We want to reject Jesus Christ. Maybe we're so self-dependent that it's hard to say, well, I can't save myself. Maybe, well, I think I can save myself. By the way, you cannot save yourself. But Jesus Christ can. Man's way of salvation will never say him. And then all the religions in the world are kept saying, if you believe this, if you'll do this, if you'll belong to our church, if you'll belong to our religion, then you will be saved. Folks, you can be a Baptist, Pentecostal, Church of God, um, whatever else you might add to the list, and you can still die and go to hell. Belonging to a church, belonging to a religion of whatever type in the world will not, cannot save you. Only Jesus can. People are just trying to leave God out. People just don't see a reason to give God control of your life. See, that's, that's that, probably the, the tilting point in salvation. People want to get saved. I think everybody knows they're a sinner. Amen. Does anyone, does anyone here know, don't, don't think you're a sinner? We all think we're sinners, amen? We all know that we're sinners. Do we all know Jesus Christ died upon a cross to save us? The only problem is, is we don't want God telling us what to do. Now you might say, oh, I don't mind. Yes, we do. Salvation is the surrendering of one's life to following Jesus. Why would I get saved and continue to live like I used to live? Salvation is supposed to change me. And when I give my heart and life to Jesus Christ, I make a commitment to follow him. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man. Somebody said, well, if you get baptized and you join a church and you turn over a new leaf, I think you're, I think you're okay, you'll go to heaven. That's what Proverbs 14 is talking about here. He's saying man thinks he has a way. But the end thereof are the ways of death. This word death here, by the way, has a different definition than the word we use for death. This word means destruction, the way of destruction. In other words, we destroy our life. We destroy our life on earth. We destroy our life in heaven because we're not saved and we're not going to go into the presence of an almighty God. Why do we need salvation? Why? Well, we're not saved from hell 
and we're not saved to go to heaven. That's what a lot of people think. I, I fear that many times people have heard a sermon on hell. I believe in hell. I preach hell. I preach hell hot. But if all you come is to get fire insurance and to say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and don't let me go to hell. I question if you truly got saved. Or if you say, well, I want to go to heaven. And you come to the altar and you say, Lord Jesus, come to my heart and save me so I can go to heaven. I think your motivation is wrong. I think you're asking God to do something that is not what God is offering to do. What God is offering you is to return you to the fellowship and relationship with God. Brother Trevor last week spoke about there in Genesis where Adam and Eve walked in the garden with God. And they were in a relationship. God loved on them. They loved God. But one day Adam and Eve, they sinned. And it broke the relationship between Adam and Eve and God because of their sin. When God came looking, they hid themselves in the garden because they didn't want God to find them because they had now sin upon them. And so as they ran from God, God hunts them down and finds them and offers them a sacrifice by which they might be saved. He kills an animal. The blood is shed that they might be forgiven of their sin to restore to a relationship, a fellowship with God. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did for you and me. God's plan of salvation, there's only one way, and he doesn't save you from hell, and he doesn't save you to go to heaven. He saves you to know him. He saves you to be in a relationship. The Bible uses the word two or three times, like the word covenant, which is the same word when we talk about marriage. When God saves you, you enter into a covenant with him, a salvation covenant. You become his. Ephesians says that we are the bride of Christ. Same concept. That when we get saved, we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. He loves us and we love him. Let me walk you through the plan of salvation. I want to make sure everybody here today knows exactly what the plan of salvation is. How God saves you. First, I am a sinner. You must admit, we said a while ago, we all agreed that we are sinners. We are sinners two ways, by nature and by choice. By nature through Adam, the Bible says all men have sinned, that through Adam every man became a sinner. But even if Adam had not been the first sinner, if you had been the first man on this earth, you would have also chosen to rebel and go your own way. We are sinners by nature through Adam, but we're also a sinner because we choose to do it. And if you don't think you would, go tomorrow without sinning. Try to go one day without sinning. And by the way, the first time somebody pulls over in front of you and you say, what are they in there doing? Just remember that was a sin. The first time you forget to witness about Jesus tomorrow and we're commanded to be a witness, you just sinned. None of us go all day long without sin. We all sin and we all sin every day. It might not be what we call the, the bigger type of sin. We didn't murder anybody or commit adultery today. But we can sin so simply by even just disobeying what God has told us to do because that's called rebellion. Romans 3.23, for all, for every one of us have sinned. I need God to forgive me of my sin, my rebellion against him. Second, I am a sinner. Second, I need a sacrifice that can save me. Romans chapter 5 verse 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for me. The word's us. For you. For every one of us. For everybody ever born on the face of this earth. Christ died for all of them. Why were you yet sinners? See, we don't do something to become good enough for Christ to die for us or for Christ to save us. Christ saves us while we're sinners. Christ died upon the cross when we weren't even born yet. God said, I'm going to send the sacrifice for those in the future as well as those in the past. Remember your Old Testament scriptures? That how the children of Israel would commit sin. And they would take a lamb and they would go to the tabernacle. You see there on the left hand side, the fire burning. They would take that lamb, cut his throat, take the blood, throw the lamb into that fire and burn the body as a sacrifice to God. They would take the blood and go into the tabernacle there on the right and sprinkle it upon the Ark of the Covenant. And God would look down from heaven and accept what they did for their salvation. A sacrifice was made 
But God didn't say that lamb, that lamb saved your life. God didn't accept that that lamb was good enough. God says, I have my own lamb that one day will come and his name is Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So that just nullifies every sacrifice made in the Old Testament. No sacrifice. These people would take a lamb and they would put their hands on the head or on the back of that animal and they would pray and they'd say, God, take my sins off of me and put them on this lamb. God, take the sins of my family and put them on this lamb. And we're going to sacrifice this lamb and he'll die for my sins and my family's sin. That's the way it was done in the Old Testament. But God in the New Testament says that their blood was never good enough. But the death of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who was the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, he died for the Old Testament saints. That Lamb was a picture of Jesus one day coming to die. He dies for us today, and he will die for every person that remains in the future, taking their place. He is a worldwide, universal, all-time sacrifice for sin. He took our place. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God committed his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Him for me. Him for you. Salvation is recognizing I am a sinner. And salvation is recognizing that I must give my life to Jesus Christ. That Christ provided my salvation. He died for me. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Christ also has once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, Christ for me, Christ for you, that he might bring us unto God. Salvation recognizes I must surrender myself to Jesus Christ. What's the first thing we must admit? I am a what? Then we must admit that Jesus Christ died for me. He is the sacrifice for my sins. And the third thing is the commitment of my life. The world is full of religious people who believe that they are a sinner and they confess their sins. They might weekly go to confess. They might even come to the altar today and say, well, I did this this week and I did that week. You might even pray every night and say, God, forgive me. I did this, I did this, I did this. And you're confessing your sins. It's not that you're confessing your sins. You're confessing that you are the sinner. And then you must say, and I believe Jesus Christ died that I might be saved. Christ died for me that I might be saved. And people believe this and people confess their sins and people say, I know Jesus Christ died, but they never take step three, the commitment of one's life to Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10 verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. It could have said with thy mouth Jesus, but it didn't. God emphasized Lordship, Verse 13, And whosoever anybody shall call upon the name of the Lord. It, he didn't say Jesus or Christ or the Messiah. He said call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you say I am a sinner and when you say I know Jesus Christ died for me, there's that third step, the final step of salvation where you give him your life. I surrender all. Why would just believing be enough because lost people believe matter of fact do you know the Bible says that the demons in hell believe in God to the point that it says they tremble they believe and lost as they can be people in the world believe but never give their life to Jesus Christ are you sure today that you've given your life to Jesus Christ Salvation recognizes that I must surrender, that you must surrender ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I am a sinner. Christ died for me. Lord, I give it to you. I give you my life. Lord, I've messed it up, and you said you'll change me. You'll make me a new creature in Christ. You say that if I give you my life, you'll turn me into a different person, that you'll give me the mind of Christ. No longer being who we once were, but becoming who God says we can be. Father in heaven.